So it is my pleasure tonight to uh, welcome Dr. Peter Alagona back to Snarl. Um, Peter actually has been at Snarl many, many times. Uh, he is one of our faculty advisors from UC Santa Barbara, and uh, he has a, a deep love for Snarl, I think, and uh, loves to come back here, so it wasn't too hard to twist his arm to come here. Um, he is an environmental historian, and Peter has worked on uh, lots of different projects, one of which was incredibly ambitious. He and his students have gone around to University of California natural reserves across the systems and have done um, an archive project of all of the historical materials available at those reserves. So he's come here to Snarl and done that. Field notes, maps, things like that, and put them together and they're actually available online. Um, and it's an incredible resource. And that's how I first really got to know Peter. Um, and Peter is uh, a professor at UC Santa Barbara and has been working across uh, various sort of interfaces, I would say, between biology, ecology, and history. And that's really his specialty. So tonight, um, he's going to be talking about bears. Um, I've had a lot of bears in my life in the last couple of weeks. And so <laughs> this is a topic that hits near and dear to my heart. Um, so bear essential, the past, present, and potential future of grizzlies in California. I was going to mention one more thing while Peter's getting hooked up here. Um, if you enjoy tonight's talk, Peter is, uh, he's authored numerous books. He's working on one right now, but this is a really great book, After the Grizzly, um, and it's available through the University of California Press, also available on Amazon, um, and uh, this is sort of a little bit of the story he's going to be telling tonight. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, can everybody hear me in the back there? Yeah. Great, great. Well, um, Snarl is a little bit of a home away from home for me, and it's really great to be back. It's amazing to drive six hours from Santa Barbara and see so many familiar faces. Um, so those of you who are up from Santa Barbara, thanks for coming. And uh, it's just a really, a really fantastic pleasure to be here. I always love coming. Uh, I think I'll start off tonight with a question. Who here has seen a grizzly bear? Anywhere. Could be the zoo. Who's been to the Bronx Zoo and seen a grizzly bear? Okay. Okay. Who's seen one in the wild? Wow. This is an unusual audience, <laughs> seeing grizzly bears in the wild. Where did you see one? Alberta. Montana, Alberta, Yellowstone, Alaska. Great. Where? Jackson Hole. Great. Fantastic. Who here has seen a wild grizzly in California? Aha. Uh -huh. You'd have to be pretty old. You'd have to be about 94 years old, at least, and have a really good memory, right? Um, grizzlies have been considered extinct in California since the 1920s, since 1924. Uh, that was the last credible sighting of a grizzly in California. But tonight, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about a project uh, that I've been involved in as sort of the founder and facilitator of a research group based at UCSB. Uh, this endeavor started about two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, uh, in 2016, and uh, is moving ahead full steam. And essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to be uh, the first group in about 60 years, or more than 60 years actually, since the 1950s, to really take a hard look, a fresh look, at the history of grizzlies in California, which I'll talk a bit about tonight, about the current status of them, which is actually the short part of the story. I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, and maybe even their potential future in this state. And as I say that, I want to acknowledge that sometimes, leading this project, I feel like this guy right here. <laughs> now, that that's, looks like a black bear to me, not a grizzly. But this is a, um, the uh, cover of a Victorian adventure tale collection of stories uh, from California in the late 19th century. And I can really identify with this guy because sometimes it does feel like jumping off a cliff. And I know that this topic, thinking about grizzlies in California, they've been gone for, for so long. Um, we have 40 million people in the state. The state has changed so much. Uh, I know this topic might sound you know, a little bit crazy to some of you as more than just a historical curiosity. Uh, but hopefully by the end of the night tonight, you'll be able to tell me whether it's a good crazy or a bad crazy. 
So that's the goal, okay? All right, so let's start off with a little bit of brown bear basics for those of you uh, who might be new to this topic. So the, a grizzly is the North American name for a brown bear, okay? That's the first thing you need to know. Grizzly, or brown bear, uh, is one of eight true bear species currently um, existing around the world. Uh, there are eight. There used to be more during the Pleistocene, for example, uh, but now we're down to eight. And so there are eight true bear species. We have the grizzly up here. We have the Asiatic black bear, the sun bear, the sloth bear, the American black bear, the spectacled bear, the panda, and the polar bear. The polar bear is actually the one that's most closely related to grizzlies. They can actually hybridize and produce fertile offspring. Uh, and they are doing so more and more, in fact, uh, in an era of climate change where their ranges are overlapping. So the grizzly is one of eight true bear species uh, existing today around the world. Now this is a, kind of jumping in the deep end here. It gets a little bit technical pretty quick, but I'll just kind of explain what this means. Uh, since about the 1960s, uh, when the current subspecies classification system uh, came into being for brown bears, uh, brown bear researchers, scholars, uh, scientists have considered there to be about 15 subspecies of brown bears worldwide. So it's one species with 15 subspecies. This is the arrangement that's existed since uh, about the 1960s. And of those 15, three are currently considered, currently considered extinct, and one of them is the California grizzly. It's recognized as still as a unique subspecies of brown bear, currently considered extinct. However, Research uh, conducted with uh, new genetic techniques beginning in the 1990s and increasingly through today has suggested that this classification system uh, probably doesn't really reflect the genetic or evolutionary history or genetic relatedness of the current brown bears that exist around the world today. As a matter of fact, it seems that there are probably only five real lineages, distinct genetic lineages of brown bears that exist worldwide today, probably not 15, probably more like five. Uh, we call them clades, it's a lineage, uh, evolutionary lineage. And the California grizzly is part of clade four, uh, which includes bears that currently exist in places like Yellowstone and Montana and British Columbia. And so it's a question as to whether or not in the future we will still have 15 subspecies of brown bears worldwide. Uh, we might get uh, fewer if we accept this. But the point here that I want to make as we move forward is that California grizzly is actually part of a lineage of grizzly bears that still exist on this continent, and they're very closely related to the bears that existed in California here 100 or 150 or 200 years ago. What about the geography of this species? Well, brown bears are widely distributed throughout the Northern Hemisphere. They actually live all the way from Hudson's Bay to the Persian Gulf. They live in the Middle East. They live in Asia. They live in Canada, in Alaska, of course. Uh, there are brown bear populations in, um, like I said, in the Middle East, even in places like Syria. And there are also brown bears in Europe. There are brown bears also on the northern island of Japan in Hokkaido. Uh, population estimates for brown bears worldwide, about 40,000 in Alaska. California is about a quarter the size of Alaska, and the estimate is that in California, there were probably about 10,000 grizzly bears on the eve of the gold rush. Um, so that would be a similar population density to current day Alaska, uh, although the geography is sort of complicated. Oh, and by the way, in case you were wondering, on the eve of the gold rush, there are about 110,000 people in California. So that's, you can do the math, that is one grizzly bear for every 11 people. Now, I don't know how many people are in this room, but if there was just one grizzly in this room, it would get really uncomfortable really fast, <laughs> right? So keep that in mind. Uh, there are about 25,000 in Canada, currently about 2,000 in the lower 48 US states. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. In Europe, Europe, there are about 18,000, so between nine and 10 times the number of brown bears in the lower 48 states currently in Europe. More to come on that. And then the bulk of them are in Asia and the Middle East for a total of about 200,000 brown bears worldwide. Uh, and brown bears are actually considered a IUCN species of least concern. They are endangered in many parts of their historic range, but globally, worldwide, the entire species is not considered endangered. One of the reasons for that is that they can exist in a remarkably diverse range of habitats and take remarkably diverse forms and occupy remarkably diverse ecological niches. So here we have brown bears existing in the far north, in the tundra, in places like Alaska and Canada. Here, this is actually in Spain, 
where there's a small population of brown bears still in a Mediterranean-style ecosystem, like very much like the ones we have throughout much of California. Here, of course, this is the famous uh, Brooks Camp in Alaska, where you can go and watch bears feed on, on salmon, congregate salmon specialists. And this picture is actually taken in the Gobi Desert where there's a small population of brown bears uh, that top out in size about a tenth the size of these bears in Alaska, same species. Uh, the Gobi uh, bears are not doing particularly well, but it's not because they live in a desert, it's because of their interactions with people. Again, more to come on that. So what we have is we have a globally distributed northern hemisphere species um, divided up into unique lineages, uh, but all the same species. And uh, it lives in a remarkably diverse range of habitats. So those are some brown bear basics. Now let's talk a little bit about their history in North America and uh, in California in particular. So I know the, uh, the numbers are a little small here, so I'll kind of narrate for you. The light green is the presumed uh, range of grizzly bears in the lower 48 uh, US states about 200 or 250 years ago, let's say. By the early part of the 20th century, mid 20th century, their range had become restricted to much smaller areas throughout the lower 48 states. So whereas they occurred very widely in a wide range of hab habitats in places like Colorado and New Mexico and Oregon and Washington and Idaho and California, by the early part of the 20th century, they had become restricted to essentially remote mountain ranges uh, where they were not being quite so much harassed by people, although that was to come as well. And so if you see the last credible sightings, known extinctions of grizzly bears throughout the West, uh, there's sightings in Colorado as late as the 1950s and even into the 1970s, although th that last one is a little sketchy. Uh, in, uh, into the 1960s in northern Mexico, in California, we have our last credible sighting of a brown bear, of a California grizzly in the wild in 1924 on the west slope of Sequoia National Park, so to the southwest of here. It is worth mentioning, though, that grizzlies lived throughout California. This is a map drawn by a naturalist named C. Hart Merriam, who was the first, first director of the agency that many iterations later became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He was a naturalist, and he drew a lot of range maps. He actually divided California grizzlies into seven unique subspecies and gave them all names. Uh, Merriam actually divided global brown bears into 90 subspecies. So if you're familiar with the idea of lumping and splitting, he was a mega splitter, right? Um, he liked to name things. Uh, but you get a sense here just in general of uh, the distribution of brown bears, and I think that this is a very conservative estimate. So by the time Merriam was drawing this, brown bears had been uh, moved out of the Central Valley, extirpated from the Central Valley, but they almost certainly occurred there before, same along some of the coastal areas. And so brown bears existed throughout California, basically in any area that wasn't um, a hot desert, uh, and they were so common in the areas that are now pretty populated along the coast that they became known as the chaparral bear. So brown bears in California in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were called chaparral bears because they occurred in the lower foothills, coastal mountains, and places like that where we have brushy Mediterranean style vegetation. So the first Europeans, brown bears have a very long history of interactions with native people that's documented in the archeological record. The first Europeans that encountered brown bears were pretty much the first Europeans that came to California, right? And so we have this documentary record beginning with early Spanish encounters of brown bears in California and going right through uh, the uh, Mission and Rancho eras. This is a depiction, this is drawn in the, or painted in the 19th century of what it would have been like for an early Spanish explorer to encounter a brown bear feasting on the carcass of a marine mammal along the coast in some place like San Luis Obispo or Monterey County. During the Mission and Rancho eras, brown bears started to take on um, a different role, and there's uh, some suggestion that the population's changed somewhat. So the population, I said a minute ago, of people in California on the eve of the gold rush was about 110,000. That was way down from a population 100 years before, or 200 years before, that was something like 350,000, a much larger Native American population that was decimated by violence and disease. We know that story. Brown bears, it seems, benefited in some ways from this period of missionization and rancho, uh, ranching culture. Uh, Native Americans were largely removed from the landscape. They were um, 
Brown bears were free to forage in areas where they had possibly been excluded, like in prime fishing zones for salmon, uh, or, or places where people like to harvest pine nuts or acorns, which we know were staple diets of brown bears, and we're learning more of that. Uh, but brown bears also, in addition to growing in population, uh, became the subject of sort of lore and um, kind of recreation and these sort of manly pursuits, like roping brown bears here. Um, this is depicted from San Luis Obispo County, Rancho Santa Margarita. Brown bears were also subject to a variety of kind of entertainment. Um, some of you may be familiar with the idea of bear and bullfights. This was something that was um, actually done in Roman times. It, was, it continued in the Iberian Peninsula in the in places that became Spain and Portugal for many years. And then it was replicated throughout Spanish-speaking North America, from California to central Mexico, all the way to Louisiana. There were bear and bullfights that were staged in town squares uh, and in presidios here in California. Um, the bears would almost always win, but it was never a foregone conclusion. No one really knew what was going to happen. Sometimes the bulls would win. Uh, this was the kind of thing that became um, outlawed uh, fairly quickly um, as uh, more Anglo people started to move into the state and as a kind of more Victorian moralistic culture developed around uh, what was believed to be a kind of corrosive influence of these um, spectacles on the populace, on people. But they lasted for quite a while here in California. By the time of the gold rush, bears are starting to decline very rapidly, grizzly bears, and, uh, but yet they get kind of brought into this um, story about the fading frontier in California. And so at the very time that California's population is starting to explode with immigrants from all over the world, including from the eastern United States, bear population is declining dramatically because they're getting poisoned and shot. So this is not an issue of habitat loss. This is an issue of direct killing. Um, the animal is becoming the symbol of the state. And so this is the time when it starts to appear on flags representing California, uh, later on the state seal, and uh, also as mascots of state universities, for example. Uh, during this period, during the 1850s and 1860s, uh, brown bears were sort of brought in to play these roles as representatives, like I said, of the fading frontier. This is Grizzly Adams depicted. Um, he was actually a real person. He ran a, what he called a museum. It was really more like a circus in a weird basement um, of a building in downtown San Francisco at the corner of Clay and Kearney Streets, wow. if you know where that is. Um, and so uh, if you read about what he was doing, he had you know, dozens of animals, grizzlies, mountain lions, uh, African lions, uh, deer, you know, monkeys, and he had these brass bands that would play, and then he'd parade them out in the streets, and sometimes the animals would get loose, and they'd chase them through downtown San Francisco. And so this is the kind of thing that happened in 19th century America. Um, but he was this kind of clown in a way. He was, you know, he called it a museum, and he called himself a curator, but it was really a circus, and he was actually a clown, right? And, uh, but what he was trying to do is he was trying to essentially get rich off of this idea of the fading frontier using this bear as uh, a symbol of it. And so it became a symbol of our state. Things got pretty gruesome at various points. This was actually a 19th century uh, tradition of making furniture out of animals. You can look online and see some really weird uh, kind of gruesome examples of this. This guy, Seth Kinman, was like uh, Grizzly Adams on steroids. Um, by the way, most of these guys died of wounds inflicted by their animals. Adams died in 1860 of, of uh, complications from a number of pretty massive bear-inflicted head wounds. He was only like 48 at the time. Um, but Kinman uh, did things like this. He developed this uh, grizzly chair and he sent it to President Andrew Johnson uh, shortly after Lincoln's death in 1865 uh, to kind of, as a kind of gift uh, from uh, the Western frontier. And so this is what grizzlies kind of became in the late 19th century, a symbol um, of, of this uh, fading idea of what um, Native, Native America, Native California was, um, but also something that was kind of mobilized um, by people like this who wanted to make a buck. This is the last uh, live California grizzly that almost anyone ever saw. Um, his name is Monarch. Uh, the way he got that name is this strange story. He was actually named by um, William Randolph Hearst, who paid a reporter to go and search for one of the last California grizzlies. He ended up finding one in a really strange story in the mountains north of LA in 1889. Uh, managed to bring it back by wagon and train uh, all the way to San Francisco. Monarch lived uh, first at a place called Woodward's Garden, which was kind of like a Coney Island place that no longer exists in San Francisco. And then later at a zoo um, 
in uh, Golden Gate Park until 1911 when he was euthanized there, and this is Monarch today. Uh, now he's uh, actually in the basement at the California Academy of Sciences, and um, uh, there are plans to refurbish him and try to bring him back onto the main floor as part of a new California grizzly exhibit. So let's talk about the present. So this is what we got. This is what we got in the present. This is the UCLA Bruin. So grizzlies are pretty much everywhere in the state today except alive. They are on mascots. They're on t-shirts. They're on hats. Half the kids in my classes are wearing grizzlies somewhere on their body. Many of them have tattoos of grizzlies. They might not even know it's a grizzly. They might think it's a black bear. Who knows? Uh, but that's commitment, right? Uh, you got to applaud them for that. So, uh, you know, this is, this is what we have of grizzlies today. We have um, this kind of weird irony, right, where we have a state mascot, a state symbol that's been extinct here for more than 90 years, right? This is where we're at. So what about in the lower 48 U.S. states more generally? Well, since the 1970s, since 1975, under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, there's been an effort to recover brown bears, grizzlies, in the lower 48 U.S. states. It started out pretty slow and has met with significantly more success in recent years. There are a uh, number of populations that are designated here as targets for recovery. They're all in the Northern Rockies or North Cascades. And so the population areas are the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, which is here, one of the populations targeted for recovery. Uh, the Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem up here, which includes Glacier National Park and the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Uh, the Bitterroot Mountains in Idaho, which actually don't have any grizzlies yet, um, but there are plans to bring them back, and it's been, people have been working through that for a long time. Uh, the Selway uh, area up here, the Cabinet Yak Mountains in northern Montana, and then this really interesting one here, which is the North Cascades in northern Washington, northeast of Seattle. Uh, the North Cascades has been engaged for about 25 years in a project to determine whether there are any grizzlies in the North Cascades. Uh, there's no firm evidence as of yet, but uh, just within the last several months, they've been able to pass uh, a, or to complete, I should say, an environmental impact statement uh, that has uh, options for a plan for bringing grizzlies back or augmenting their populations in the North Cascades. State of Washington seems pretty behind it at this point. Um, and uh, believe it or not, even the Trump administration is, is actually supporting this in the form of Ryan Zinke showing up there uh, unannounced at the National Park and making his own uh, proclamation that he was in favor of grizzlies in the North Cascades. That happened a couple months ago. It was totally bizarre. The people up there don't know what to make of it. They didn't know it was coming. He just showed up. He made this announcement. He left. Their jaws were still on the floor, and they're trying to recover from it. Okay. <laughs> So in 2013, I, I finished this book that Carol uh, mentioned, um, and it's really a history of endangered species in California, right? It's looking at the science and the politics and how they kind of work together in the law and why people sort of fight so much about, about endangered species. And in this book, I wrote, um, in the first chapter, I wrote a lot about the California grizzly. I didn't talk anything about the present or recovery. I framed it as what I would call as a historian kind of dead history. What I mean by that is something that's in the past and always will be. It's of kind of interest historically, but it's not really relevant to the present. Well, a year after um, I published that book, I was going around and talking with, with groups like this and about the book and about what I thought it meant for policy uh, and for today. The Center for Biological Diversity, which some of you may know as a non-governmental organization that does a lot of legal action through the Endangered Species Act, submitted a petition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list grizzlies in California and the Southwest as endangered under the Endangered Species Act and initiate a reintroduction and recovery program. Now, you may be asking yourself or thinking to yourself, yeah, but there are no grizzlies in California and the Southwest, and you would be right, okay? What the CBD was saying in this petition was that the current plan the current efforts, which are focused only on the North Cascades and Northern Rockies, are insufficient compared to the historical range of the species, and we need to broaden those efforts. That was the CBD rationale. Well, the Fish and Wildlife Service didn't like this very much, and they found some kind of legal uh, grounds on which to not even review, but just reject the petition out of hand. 
Um, and I can talk about that if you want, but um, to be honest, it's kind of boring. They said no. Uh, and then the CBD petitioned, uh, or didn't petition, but brought this to California Fish and Department of Fish and Wildlife and said, well, would you all think about doing a scoping study? And Cal Fish and Wildlife said, well, you know, we know that we all wear grizzlies on our shirts, but no way. We don't want anything to do with this right now. We got too much on our plate, right? And so I and some friends of mine, colleagues of mine um, down in Santa Barbara were watching this unfold and read the petition. The petition, you know, it's not very good, right? And the reason, one of the reasons it's not very good, in addition to the legal problems with it, is that the last significant research on grizzlies in California was published in 1955. This book, published by the University of California Press by two fantastic biologists, Tracy Storr started the biology program at UC Davis, and Lloyd Tevis did the same uh, at UCLA, wrote this book later in their careers about the California grizzly, and then that was pretty much it, with the exception of a few little things here or there. So there wasn't anything to go on. There wasn't anything to talk about. There wasn't anything even to have an intelligent conversation about. So we're looking at this and thinking, gosh, you know, if we want to talk about this in an intelligent way and have a civil and informed dialogue about this animal, about its past, about its future maybe, then we need better information. At that same time, there were some really interesting things going on across the pond in Europe. You may remember that I mentioned that Europe has a lot more brown bears than we do in the lower 48 US states. And this should seem weird to you because the EU, if you compare it to the lower 48 US states, the EU is a little over half the land area of the lower 48 US states. It has about a third larger human population and it has no real wilderness areas. This is not really a thing in Europe. If you've been in a national park in Europe, you know you can hike to the top of the mountain. And unlike here, when you get to the top, you get to uh, a restaurant where people are sitting on the deck eating cake and drinking beer, right? That doesn't happen on the top of Mount Humphreys. All right, so in, in the EU though, there are 22 countries with brown bears in them, and the population is about 18 to 20,000. Now, it's not all going great. Brown bears in central Italy, a couple hours outside Rome, not doing too well. Brown bears in Greece, not doing so great. Some parts of Spain and the Pyrenees, recovery efforts have stumbled a few times. There's a lot of conflict there between sheep ranchers, for example, uh, and people who are trying to conserve brown bears, in this area here. Uh, but there are brown bears in 22 countries in Europe. The major population areas, of course, are in Scandinavia, as you might guess, but also in Eastern Europe, in places like Slovakia and Slovenia, that have very different conservation histories than us, very different ways of managing these animals, and very different assumptions about human interactions with them. And so in Santa Barbara, we looked at this, and we said, wow, I guess that means it's not about them, it's about us, right? It's about us. But in order to understand what that means, we really need to do a lot more work. We need to ask basic questions, and we need good information to have an intelligent discussion. And so that brings us to what's happening now and into the future. So the primary purpose of this group that we founded, California Grizzly Study Group, which we just rebranded California Grizzly Research Network um, as of the last couple weeks, is to promote, through rigorous interdisciplinary research, a more informed scholarly and public discussion about the past, present, and potential future of grizzly bears in California. This is not an activist organization. We're not out there saying we need to bring back grizzlies. What we're saying, and this may seem radical, what we're saying is that if we want to talk intelligently, we should have some knowledge to base that on, right? I mean, this is kind of an old-fashioned thing. I know it's really weird, but that's what we're doing, okay? And so what we've decided to do is to approach this idea, this uh, issue, from a bunch of different perspectives. So we've assembled historians, geographers, and ecologists. We're talking now with geneticists, we've got paleontologists, we've got political scientists and sociologists, we've got people from the education school, and we're developing new collaborations with a whole bunch of different folks, including um, some video and visual artists, which I'll talk about very briefly in just a minute. We're approaching this from every angle that we can think of, and it's growing pretty much by the day. And so the idea, again, is to provide a really sound basis for people to be able to think about and talk about this.
So we do seminars, we get out in, in the field, I'll tell you a little bit about that. We have lab work, there's Monarch again. This is uh, Alexis, one of our postdocs. She's actually based down at the La Brea Tar Pits. Now she's looking into the evolutionary history of bears in California to try to understand what grizzly bears did here. Weirdly, there are very few grizzly bears in the tar pits, but there are a lot of short-faced bears. Um, okay, so let me tell you about a few of the studies we've been working on here and some of the preliminary results, and then I'll tell you about what we're, uh, what we're doing now and where this is all going. Uh, and then I'll kind of just make some general broad comments and we'll open it up to discussion because I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So one of the first studies that we started as part of this, um, part of this project was we said, okay, if you were going to ask the most basic question about an animal, what would you ask? And uh, we said, well, what does it eat, right? <laughs> I mean, that is like kind of the most basic question. So we said, well, what do grizzlies eat in California? And this is actually turns out to be kind of a profound question because if you look at what grizzlies eat in all the different areas where they live right now, remember that picture I showed of all the different habitats? They eat all kinds of different things. You've got salmon specialists. You've got bears that eat, you know, a handful of different things like in Yellowstone, cutthroat trout, uh, cutworm moths, pine, uh, pine nuts, things like that. Uh, you've got grizzly bears living in Mediterranean-style ecosystems in places like Spain. You've got grizzly bears living in places that aren't Mediterranean-style ecosystems but have some of the same resources we have here, like in northern Japan where they have a lot of oaks. So what did California grizzlies eat? And what were the resources that were available to them and that we would need to understand their historical ecology in this state? And so to do that, what we've done is we've um, adopted uh, a widely used technique called stable isotope analysis, where you can basically try to understand what animals ate by looking at um, the composition uh, of their bones, of their hard parts. And actually, you can do it with their hair, too, but there are some uh, issues around that related to um, timing, because animals shed hair, uh, you know, seasonally oftentimes, but the bones stay there over the long term. And so... We're working with a, a few different groups, UC Irvine, Stanford, La Brea Tar Pits, uh, Page Museum there. And uh, we've almost, we're getting close to some results. Uh, but what we found is that, first of all, we've been able to identify about 50-ish California grizzly specimens from museums around the world. Uh, many of these are in California. Some of them are at the Smithsonian in Washington. There are a handful in Europe as well. Uh, of those, uh, there are a smaller fraction that actually have usable uh, specimens and where we have the data on where they were collected and when you need that. Uh, but we, one of the things we've discovered is that California's grizzlies are not really generalizable in what they were doing. Uh, some of them were eating uh, diets that included significant fractions of marine animals. Uh, and some of them were eating much more diverse diets. You have animals that were probably largely vegetarian in some areas uh, and others that were not. We're also trying to figure out if we can pick out a signature of European colonization because there's this story in the historical record about grizzlies doing really well during the Mission and Rancho eras because they started eating a whole bunch of Spanish livestock, right? That's the idea. But that's kind of, there's kind of circumstantial evidence around that, and we don't know if it's true. And one of the ways we're trying to get at it is to look at the ways in which these stable isotopes in um, the food they eat is being um, stored and captured in their body parts, in their hard parts, claws, uh, bones, and teeth. So stay tuned. More on that to come. Another thing we did is we did, uh, we had some political scientists in our group who did a public opinion and knowledge survey about grizzlies in California. What do people know? and what do people think? What do you think people know and think? Not much, that's exactly right. <laughs> Not much. It turns out that only 25% of Californians know that there are not currently grizzlies in the state, which I think makes the reintroduction program much easier. <laughs> I did not say that. That's off the record. This is being recorded. We're gonna edit this, okay. so. So it turns out that about 25% of Californians know there aren't grizzlies in the state. Uh, about 25% of Californians are pretty positive that there are grizzlies in the state. And then about 50% don't really know. And so um, our political, my colleague political scientist, Sarah Anderson, um, in a very profound way said, we're existing in a low knowledge environment, <laughs> right? Um, but it's interesting because it has, uh, it has potential implications for the discussion that can move forward. People don't have a lot of really firm beliefs about this. They're not committed to one side or the other, one team or the other. Um, and so there's a sense that in a low knowledge environment, you, you have the potential with good information um, and an effective education program to at least have a civil discussion 
um, without it going, going too far off the rails, at least too quickly. And so this is a hypothesis that we now have that, well, maybe we can look at this over time and see how attitudes change as there's more coverage about this and as people learn more from the kinds of studies that our group is doing. Here's a hot potato. Uh, where would you put them? Um, so it turns out that, um, don't worry, okay? Um, it turns out that it's really hard to figure out where to put these animals in California. <laughs> and it's not just because California is hard, it's actually not as hard as like Italy at all, which has a Mediterranean style ecosystem, is smaller and has more people, right? And still has brown bears. Um, it's hard because all the models that have been developed to understand where grizzlies can live, what their suitable habitat is, are based on areas like Yellowstone and Glacier and you know, southeastern Alaska. They're not, these models have not been developed for places like the High Sierra or the Los Padres National Forest, for example. And so what we need to do to even have a sense of how this would work is we need to uh, assess those models, which we've been doing, test them for California, see what kind of weird results they come up with, and then tweak them using other kinds of information, like what we're learning from the historical record about what these animals ate here, right? That can help us to change the models, to tweak them for a different place, for a different system, uh, and then develop better models that can more clearly identify where are some of the potential areas that you might even want to think about. Turns out um, that though, that on a very broad scale, you know, there are basically four big chunks of uh, fairly contiguous wildland in California. Northeast, Modoc Cascade, there are big chunks in the Northwest Forest. I'm not gonna talk about this area. And then the Los Padres, right? Which is my backyard. Uh, but, you know, this is an ongoing process of trying to figure out really what population viability looks like or might look like based on modeling, based on real data, uh, based on the historical record. And so this is another ongoing part of this project. Now I'm going to tell you about a, a bunch of uh, sub-projects, projects that we're doing that are all underway. And I know you probably can't see this, but this is really more for me to talk about them. We've got a new project going on with some folks at Oregon State and in Montana and actually in Australia as well, looking at the potential ecological impacts of bringing grizzlies back to California in terms of things like how ecosystems function, but also potential impacts on other species of concern like mountain lions or deer or, um, uh, or black bears. We've got a collaboration with a group of philosophers actually at the University of Colorado in Boulder that's interested in environmental ethics. Uh, and is concerned about um, the ethics of reintroduction from a whole variety of different perspectives, from public safety to animal welfare uh, to any number of other issues. And so we've got a collaboration that's going on with them that's in its early stages. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, we are developing the first fairly comprehensive database of grizzly sightings and interactions and specimens, mascots, place names. Turns out there are like 800 place names in California with grizzly or bear as a part of the place name. Um, and almost all those bear names are named after grizzlies because when these places were being named, grizzly bears were really the prominent species in the state. Um, so we're developing an interactive atlas of the historical landscape and legacy of these animals that will be accessible for anybody from researchers who can use the database to school children who can zoom in on their neighborhood and see that there was a, someone saw a grizzly bear a mile from their house in 1888 or something like that. And so this is something that's really fun. We're working with a design firm up in San Francisco that does this amazing uh, kind of cutting edge uh, uh, digital cartography interactive mapping work. We've got some kind of conceptual stuff. I'm not gonna talk too much about this. This I'm super excited about. Uh, we just got a big grant to fund a postdoc for a couple years um, to go into um, communities that could be near potential reintroduction sites to talk to people about their potential uh, desires, wants, fears, concerns, terrors nightmares, anything else that might come up. Um, we're developing an education, new educational curriculum for little kids uh, and this immersive video art project. Uh, is anybody here from, San from Santa Barbara? Does anybody live down there? Okay, did anybody um, a month or so ago go to the uh, Entangled Waters exhibit that was projected onto the courthouse? Ah, it's a really cool thing. A video artist named Ethan Turpin um, developed this really great project that was really about ocean pollution, but very abstract. Uh, wonderful, was projected all over the courthouse in downtown Santa Barbara. You can see videos of it online. He's done other amazing projects that allow people to feel like they're immersed in a wildland fire in a room. Uh, very, very cool work. 
we're working with him. He and I and a couple other people are developing um, a, a National Geographic proposal around this. Uh, we're just, we've just paired up with um, a fantastic scholar named Beth Shapiro, um, who wrote a book that some of you may be familiar with called How to Clone a Mammoth. Um, she's at UC Santa Cruz. She's at the forefront of de-extinction, but also using genetics for conservation, uh, looking at the potential to um, sequence these grizzly specimens and get a better sense of uh, the genetic relationship of them and other uh, current brown bear populations. Want to do something like this. It hasn't happened yet. Um, same with this. And then this big one, which is that um, based on all of this work, uh, we're talking about rewriting that 1955 book, that last major book that really took a look at grizzlies in California for a broad audience for people who want to understand this from a 21st century perspective. All right, so I want to say um, a few final things now. So, um, you know, this is really interesting from an academic perspective, right? There's so many different angles. You could spend a whole career doing this. You know, I expect to be older and grayer still doing this. Um, but it's more than that, right? It's more than that. So what, what really is the good of doing this, right? I think there are a few things. The first one is just basic knowledge, right? I think that, um, you know, just this fact that so few Californians really know about this animal, know how important it was, know how prominent it was on our landscape, know the legacy it left behind. It's invisible to most people. And so this just basic knowledge about these animals in California, about what they did and how they lived in this place, I think is, um, is fascinating, but I think it can also help us think about how we live here, whether or not brown bears, grizzlies ever come back to California. There's an applied part of this too, um, which is that, you know, if people eventually do want to talk about bringing these animals back, then we really need to start now developing the knowledge base that would allow us to figure out ways to do it that are sustainable and safe and fair, right? And that have the kind of process and the kind of buy-in that would enable people to really, from different walks of life, from different political persuasions, to get on board and to be able to have, like I said, a civil conversation about this. So this information is applied in that sense. A third thing, and this is really very close to me, it's very kind of near and dear to my heart, is the idea of giving history, history, a more prominent place in conservation. Too often, I think, conservationists operate on you know, the idea of the moment, on short-term studies, right? On the assumption that because things are this way now, you know, they've been that way, and this is where we need, to, we need to start from, right? And I think that history can provide us with a sort of depth of knowledge, with a kind of long-term wisdom, and also with really important questions that can actually inform conservation in an applied way. These questions, for example, that our postdoc, Alexis, who's at the Tar Pits, is working on about the ecological, deep ecological and evolutionary history of bears in California is directly relevant to questions of reintroduction because it relates to how grizzly bears and black bears interacted in this state. We don't know much about that. As a matter of fact, there are some crazy mysteries about it that I can tell you about in a few minutes um, in question and answer. But the point here is that we need that depth of time, that perspective, to really think wisely about conservation. And then the final thing, that I want to mention um, about this. The final reason I think this is important is that, you know, the way conservation is operated, I'm a conservation historian. The way conservation has operated for the last hundred years, since its inception, um, has really been, I mean, it's a very diverse endeavor, obviously, but the idea for a lot of that time, particularly in the last like 40 years, since the 1970s, 80s, has been to try to protect the last things that are out there, you know, the last scraps of things, you know, the Nature Conservancy last best places sort of campaign. And there's a lot to that. That's really important. But I think that right now, many of us are in a place where we're feeling a little down about things, right? And it seems like the possibilities for positive change are diminishing. It's very easy to imagine, you know, the end of the world these days, right? I mean, we're inundated with apocalyptic narratives, right, in the media, right, and in popular culture. What I would like to do is I would like to use this project as a way to think about alternative possible futures, right? As a way to think about positive outcomes, as a way to think about positive change, 
whatever you define that to be, brown bears or not, in California and beyond, and not just to try to be saving the last little bit of this or that. I think conservation is facing enormous challenges right now. Enormous challenges, everything from climate change to declining funding models to we don't know what to do about the advent of synthetic biology and how that'll change everything, right? But I think what we do need is we need more positive visions for the future. And I feel especially strongly about that because I teach kids, right, who are 18, 19, 20 years old, right? If we want to get them engaged, then I think we need to provide them with the idea that things can change and that they can be positive agents in that. I'm gonna say one more thing, just one. The first question I usually get asked in the question and answer session is, are these animals going to kill me? <laughs> the answer is no. Okay, so this is from Jack Olfke, who's the lead author of the environmental impact statement for reintroducing uh, brown bears in the North Cascades in Washington. And he compiled this from Yellowstone National Park. Now let's just go through this, okay? So if you go to Yellowstone, you have a chance of dying of a heart attack. By the way, one in four Americans uh, will die of cardiovascular disease. One in four will also die of cancer. You have a chance of drowning, right? You have a chance of dying from a thermal burn. Don't do that. I mean, how many signs are there that tell people not to do that, right? <laughs> Horses apparently are extremely dangerous, so watch out for them. You might get murdered, okay? Hopefully not. Falling trees, look out. They call those widow makers, right? avalanche, and then grizzly bears are way down here, okay? Along with lightning. Now, they've missed some things. Like, they didn't say, for example, how many people have died of being crushed by vending machines. That kind of thing happens. It's probably about the same as grizzly bears since 1876, okay? The point here I'm trying to make is not to make light of this situation because, in fact, these are big, strong, powerful, apex animals that can kill you. They deserve a tremendous amount of respect. And we learn that all the time when we watch movies like The Revenant, for example. Our culture is flooded with that kind of imagery. What we forget is that this risk can be managed, right? And so if you look, for example, I'll just leave this up here. I know it's a little hard to see from the back, but you can take a look at it later. I'll just leave it up. Um, the chance of having a really adverse interaction with a grizzly bear, even in a place like Yellowstone National Park where you have millions of people flushing through there every year, at the same time that these animals are out and active, is very, very low. At Brooks Camp in Alaska, where people, tourists gather to watch bears eating salmon, of course the bears are very distracted by each other and by the salmon, they don't care much about the people, but still, to my knowledge, there has not been an adverse interaction there. And so, in terms of public safety, there are inherent risks of everything, absolutely. But the risks can be minimized and that's why we need to do more research if we're really thinking about not only the past, but also the potential future of brown bears, of our mascot in this state. I'll take questions now. Yes, sir. Good question. So um, let me kind of zoom out a little bit from there and give you a bigger answer. So um, because we're studying an animal that doesn't currently exist here, right, we have some problems. We can't go out into the field and look at them in the field. We can't capture and tag them. We can't collar them. There are lots of things we can't do. So what do we have? We have the past. We have the historical record, which we're using, right? We have basically analogies, right? We have the past. We have what we know about brown bears in other parts of the country or the world. Right? So we can use that knowledge to inform how we think about this place. And then the third kind of analogy that we have is using other closely related species, like black bears. So the problem with this is that black bears in California, I, I don't think they're a very good analog for grizzly bears, and there are a whole bunch of reasons why this is. They have a really weird historical relationship with grizzlies and weird historical geography in the state. And I'm going to digress here for a second. Um, here's a bizarre story. So black bears have been in California for about two million years, according to the fossil record. Grizzly bears have only been in California for less than 20,000 years, it looks like. Maybe about 20,000. Okay, two million versus 20,000. Okay, black bears have been around for a long time. Grizzly bears are newcomers. When you talk about less than 20,000 years, what you're basically saying is that they came with us, 
to this place. Okay, so there's that. Now, black bears have been throughout California for a very long time, but the fossil record suggests, and the historical record suggests, that there were very few of them in California, in, or in Southern California at least, during the 19th century. This was an area, like the mountains above LA, where there were tons of grizzly bears. And so people have thought, oh, well, they must have been occupying different kinds of niches, or maybe grizzly bears were out competing them. But this doesn't really comport with what's going on in a place like Yellowstone now, which is that they both live in the same area and they have some overlap and they try to avoid each other, but they, they do sort of similar things, right? It turns out, recent genetic studies have shown that black bears in Southern California all pretty much derive from a population of about 35 or so individuals that was rounded up as problem bears in Yosemite in the 1930s and dumped in the mountains north of LA. <laughs> this is why history is important. Right? Okay? So the, we now have documents that suggest that. We have correspondence between um, Angeles National Forest and Yosemite National Park, and we have genetic studies. And so all of this suggests a whole bunch of mysteries about the interaction of these animals in California and the kinds of niches that they, um, that they occupied and the way they uh, interacted within those spaces. So there are ways in which black bears can provide some um, uh, clues, right? But they're pretty different kinds of animals, and the historical record at least suggests that um, they may not be a great comparison. Yeah. Oh, one other thing. We've got a population of black bears in California right now that's about tripled since the 1980s. It's up from about 10,000 to something close to 35,000. Um, so, you know, if we're concerned about bringing in some grizzly bears, I think we should probably think about the black bear population and how we've managed that or haven't managed that. Uh, and the impacts that, that thinking about something like this might have on that. Yes? Yeah, so the, are the grizzlies, quote, special in comparison to the wolf introductions now that are going on? Or did they have to be both adverse effects or adverse effects of the grizzlies? Okay, so, um, so what, what do you mean by adverse effects? Well, well it seems like the Center for Biological Diversity, which we're uh, supporters of, yep. So, so there's a, okay, so that's a great question. So um, this, is a, this is a conversation that we could have over many beers um, after this. But um, wolves are making their way into California on their own four feet, right? Um, they're moving across the west and into the southwest and into California at a pretty rapid rate. Wolves are pretty mobile. And um, when they first arrived, when the first wolves arrived in California several years ago, Cal Fish and Wildlife was... Um, caught on the back of their heels a little bit. And so in the years afterward, they developed a kind of management plan, if you want to call it that, that basically says we're not going to manage them <laughs> um, in a way, right? Uh, and so they're kind of letting the, the, the reintroduction of wolves happen um, naturally. Of course, it's not natural because they're, they're moving through a very human-dominated landscape, right? So that's what's happening with wolves. Uh, grizzly bears do not move nearly as much as wolves, and the closest population of grizzly bears cur that currently exists is really in Wyoming, and then also maybe Washington. And so it is unlikely that, unlike wolves, grizzly bears would find their way to California on their own four feet anytime soon. Okay? So that's a significant difference. Now, there is a wrinkle in that, though, which is that the paradigm in the literature has been that grizzly bears don't move very much. And when they do move, it's almost always young males that are striking out in search of their own territory and are fleeing aggression by more dominant males. So that's been the kind of belief that's guided us thinking about brown bear movement, at least in North America, for a long time. That is about to go the way of the dodo. And here's what I mean by that. Over the past few years, as brown bear populations have sort of reached something close to carrying capacity, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and also in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, Glacier National Park area, bears have started to move a lot. It turns out that them staying put, and this isn't even really in the literature yet, it turns out that them staying put is probably a density-related thing. If you, get, if you achieve a certain level of density, then they start moving a lot more. And not only that, but it's not only the young males, it's females with cubs. Because if you are a female with a cub in an area with a lot of young males, you are in an extremely dangerous situation. And so females with cubs are starting to show up 
30 miles east of the Rocky Mountain Front on the Great Plains in Montana. They're starting to show up in the canyons and back of Missoula, which is in between Yellowstone and Glacier, for the first time in decades. And so the way we think about brown bear movement is changing very rapidly now that we see these dynamics starting to emerge just as of the past few years. I'm not saying that brown bears like wolves are going to make their way to California on their own, but I think that the, um, the way we think about how they move is changing very quickly. Yes, sir. And then in the back. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that is true in some areas. So in some parts of, um, in some parts of the world, particularly in southeastern Alaska, um, where you have very high quality habitat, right, um, black bears tend to be um, moved to more marginal spaces. And brown bears tend, although you're in a dynamic environment, animals are moving around a lot, brown bears tend to dominate the choicer spots, right? Uh, and so that has been documented. You're absolutely correct in parts of Alaska. And so there's some, what you'd call like spatial partitioning of habitat um, in that part of the world. Uh, there's less evidence for that in some other places like Yellowstone, where the resources are distributed spatially in a really different way, and the animals are, seem to be interacting and moving around really differently. So I think the point to draw from your point, which is absolutely right on, is that the geography of a particular place really matters in shaping how these kinds of species interact with each other, right? Um, and so California is a really different kind of a landscape than the archipelagos off southeastern Alaska, right? Thank you. Yeah, in the back, hat. Yeah, so we know some from the archaeological record, and we know some from the ethnographic anthropological record of people recording um, uh, stories and myths and things like that in the, in the 19th century. Uh, and so there was this kind of idea for a very long time that native, that indigenous people in California were sort of, were pretty scared of grizzlies, they avoided them, um, and, uh, and they kind of also revered them, right? Uh, I tend to think as a historian, I tend to approach that story um, with a great degree of skepticism, right? Um, because it sounds a little Eurocentric to me, right? Um, it sounds to me like European authors saying, well, you know, once we came in, you know, we could get these animals out of here, but those people didn't, they weren't really capable of that, right? And so I think that we're overdue for a reassessment of the archeological record in this way, and I would love to work with an archeologist on this. Um, but we do have a pretty thick uh, record of uh, grizzly interactions from midden sites and from indigenous art. And we know that these animals were very common and that uh, people interacted with them in a whole lot of different ways, from ceremonial uh, interactions to um, competition for resources um, to conflict and potentially even in some cases control, right? There is no reason, if you believe that people had any part in destroying the Pleistocene megafauna, right? 10,000, 12,000 years ago, there's no reason to believe that people couldn't do the same thing for grizzlies. Except, see, this is another rabbit hole. Except there's even another wrinkle to that, which is that maybe the reason that grizzlies survived the Pleistocene extinctions is because they came with us. See, there's this whole theory about why there's more megafauna in Africa than in the Americas and Europe. And one of the theories is that those animals, like elephants and um, African lions and other animals, kind of evolved with people as we got more sophisticated over time. Um, grizzlies may have been doing a kind of similar thing. They may have been more accustomed to us, and so they may have actually been able to survive the Pleistocene extinctions in North America, which they were newcomers to as well, even as animals like short-faced bears and saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and giant ground sloths and others died out. Right? And so these are mysteries that are, you know, hidden in the archaeological and paleontological record. Roland. My understanding about grizzly bears in the Sierra Nevada is that they were relatively uncommon except in the lower foothills. Is that borne out by your work? So this is a tough thing because there's a sampling question here. 
So if you look, for example, at the specimens we've been able to identify and use in our study of grizzly diet, um, the vast majority of them come from LA area or the Bay Area, right? And so why is that? Well, you might say, well, it's because same reason the people moved to LA and the Bay Area, because it was really fertile and had a great climate and um, you know, all of these sorts of things, and bears took advantage of that, really ecologically diverse. On the other hand, you have the simple fact that people were going to these places and they were seeing and running into bears a lot, whereas far fewer people were up here in the Sierra Nevada, except on the west side and the gold country, right? And so you have a historical, a problem with the historical data here. So to what extent can you correct for sampling error, which is the kind of thing that historians don't even really say, right? That's not part of the vocabulary, correcting for a sampling error. Um, but the concept is there so that we can try to understand the relative abundance of animals in different areas. And so um, we haven't really solved that riddle yet. Uh, what we do know is that on the eve of the gold rush, they were extremely abundant in the coastal plains, the valleys, and the foothills. What we don't know is how abundant they were in the high Sierra. Yeah. All the way in the back. Are we talking in the more current period or more, more historic? Um, more historic, like yeah. bears as lesser than, and yep. them in these violent ways, and That's a really great question. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something that historians often do. I'm gonna recommend a book. Um, uh, there's this cute little book called Bears of Cultural History. It's something that you could sit down and read probably in an evening, um, and it talks about these issues. And one of the things that I took away from, from reading that book um, is, first of all, that the interactions and relationships in deep history and recent history and currently with bears around the world are extremely diverse. There's no um, generalizable theme that we can really draw. So in some cases, it's a, almost like a symbiotic relationship. In some cases, it's more like a companionship. In other cases, it's a spiritual. There are adversarial relationships. There are domination relationships. All of it is there in the record, in the, in the diverse cultural histories of people's relationship with bears. However, I will say that in many indigenous cultures where these things are well documented, for example, in indigenous Scandinavian cultures, for example, there are long histories of um, people regarding bears as um, close to human. Not exactly human, but closer to human. So um, the, you know, kind of the way we think about apes today, right? So those people didn't have great apes in their lexicon, in their experience, but they did have bears. And so there are examples from those cultures of people thinking about spirit bears, of fellow travelers, um, of ancestor worship, these sorts of things that are very prevalent um, in the historical and cultural record of many societies. And so I think that what this says to me is that you know, the possibilities are sort of open, right? We don't have to be limited to thinking about these animals in one way. We can think of them in a lot of different kinds of ways. And as people, we have the, we have the capacity to do that because we already have. Yes? How closely related is a dog to a bear? Because the head of a bear looks a lot like the dog's head. You know, that's a really good question. I can't give you a really good answer to that. I'm a dog lover, though, and I'd really love to know. Um, does anybody here study dogs, taxonomy, wolves? OK, well, we'll have to look it up afterward. Um, you know, I honestly can't give you a really intelligent answer about that. Um, but I guess what I can say um, is that if we want to think of, of dogs as an analogy, I mean, wolves kind of hold up in some ways, but the politics of them is really different. People's relationships to them, the kinds of risks they pose are really different. Like, for example, wolves, um, so I'm kind of taking this question a little bit different direction, but um, wolves don't pose any danger to people really at all, okay? But they do pose a danger to livestock. Grizzly bears pose a modest danger to livestock, but really only young animals, so calves, right, ewes, um, and so sheep and, uh, and calves, right? Um, but 
they don't po- but they do pose a significant danger to people, right? Um, if you're in the wrong situation. So, um, you know, I think that although we sometimes see relationships um, and we look into the, these, the eyes of these animals that we recognize as being, you know, mammals, four-legged, intelligent, sometimes even intuitive, um, we, we read a lot of things into them, um, but they, they're really different in terms of their potential for interacting with us in complex ways. And so I'm not sure about the relatedness. I know that when you look into the eyes of a grizzly bear, you see something that's almost dog-like. You really do. I went up to, uh, last summer I went up to uh, Washington State University where they have a center there that um, does physiological research on grizzly bears. And so a lot of these animals are animals that have come from Yellowstone or somewhere else. Um, they're problem bears but are now engaged in these research projects. And so it's kind of a weird place. You know, you see bears like running on treadmills and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> it's bizarre. Like this is not my thing. Um, but you know, you go around, they have, they, you know, they're in kennels and um, you go around and you look into the, eye, the eyes of these animals and you do see something that is really dog-like. And the thing that, that surprised me about that experience, about getting that close to these animals, um, is that they suddenly seemed like individuals. You know, dogs to us seem like individuals, you know? Um, those bears seemed like individuals. And I think that's, that was a really profound experience for me because I tend to study them a little bit more from a distance. Yes. That's a really good question. <laughs> what do you? Yeah. You know, will you come up afterward and we can talk about it? Um, because you know we're going a lot of different directions now, and um, you know, at the f- for the first year or so, where we were really just educating ourselves about this, um, we were keeping the project a little close to our chest, you know. Um, because we were coming into this. Now I can, I can say that we are the world's experts on the California grizzly. I can say that for sure. Now, it, granted, it's a very small field. Um, but uh, now that we're in this phase of sort of uh, outreach and thinking about um, how to speak with broader audiences and how to engage more people and get folks involved, then um, I think that we are at that point. So let's talk. Yes. In the or Oh, yeah. It means the bears. Um, so, you know, that was, on, that was a kind of a relic from an old uh, map where, um, so, so Los Osos um, was uh, one of the first places where you have a, and the reason it's called Los Osos um, is that it's one of the first places where you get a really good documentary account of um, Spanish missionaries encountering bears, right? Brown bears. And so what happened here is that um, as these missionaries were making their way up to establish the first, first mission in Monterey, they stopped at several points along the coast. They were running out of resources, provisions. They stopped uh, in the Los Osos Valley, which is just directly west of San Luis Obispo, near Montaña de Oro, uh, right there. Beautiful landscape. And um, they encountered a bunch of bears. And uh, they killed a few of them, uh, got a couple of their horses killed in the process. And uh, they went up to Monterey, and then in Monterey, they found they didn't see many bears there uh, initially. They started seeing a lot more bears later on, but the conditions were pretty desperate there after a few, after, I don't even remember how long it was. It wasn't very long at all. Uh, And they ended up mounting an expedition back to San Luis Obispo to hunt bears, to kill bears, to smoke and jerk the meat, and to return back to Monterey with provisions. Um, and so the guy who led that expedition, he earned the name uh, El Oso. That was the name for the rest of his, his days. He was celebrated as a hero. He was one of the first military governors of California. And so this is one of the stories that's kind of made it into California lore about the prominent role of these animals and the visibility of them in the state at that time, what became the state. But it's only one of like 800 places with Oso and bear and grizzly names. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have time for a couple more questions, or are we? You guys want to have a couple more questions? Yes. Okay, because this Maybe is fun. Two more. This is really two more? Yeah, because we do need to let you have a beer. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, 
Mm, yes. Uh, what impact do you feel reintroducing the grizzlies will have like, on this population? That's a, that's a great question, and that's what we're trying to answer with this, uh, what I list up here is the ecological impact study. And so that really has two parts, right? So one part is trying to figure out what, what role grizzlies play in like ecological processes, because um, they do a lot of things on the landscape. They do a lot of digging, a lot of rooting, a lot of turning over rocks and boulders. Um, and they probably cause other animals to act a little bit differently around them, <laughs> right? Um, so, so we can guess why that is. So animals like people, for example. Um, so so uh, that's part of it. And then the other part of it is thinking about what the potential impacts would be on other species of concern. And so I brought up mountain lions because in Southern California, mountain lion is really the, the top predator and kind of the charismatic species. I mean, Los Angeles is now, it's now the mascot of LA essentially, right? Uh, P22 in Griffith Park. Um, and so there are a lot of questions about how something like this would affect other native species. And it depends on so many things. Like, are you talking about introducing, you know, like 10 or 100 or, you know, a lot more? Um, so that, that would be a, a question one would want to ask. Um, but what we have to do here is we have to base this on what we can know from the literature, because we can't do uh, real-time experiments, um, and what we can learn from using that information and building models with it, right? I don't suspect that there would be severe uh, um, uh, detrimental kind of interactions with uh, bighorn sheep, um, but there could be significant interactions with other animals. And so let me just use the mountain lion as an example. Um, in Yellowstone, uh, mountain lions and wolves uh, pursue prey and kill animals, right? We know that. Grizzly bears are a lot slower, which is why they can only get at the young of many hoofed animals, right, and, and prey. Um, so they don't do that. They eat a lot. They're vegetarians. They do a lot of fishing. They eat a lot of pine nuts and berries and stuff like that. But if they find a kill, they will take it, right? And so you can actually go online and you can see videos of grizzly bears stealing prey from wolf packs and from mountain, mountain lions as well, and also from black bears too, if they're the first animal to arrive at that carcass. Um, and a, what grizzly bears will actually do sometimes is they will arrive at a carcass and they'll, they'll scare away the wolves uh, or the mountain lion or, some, or other animal. They'll start eating it and then they'll have had enough and then they'll sleep on top of the carcass. <laughs> And then they'll wake up every so often and eat some more and sleep on it. And these wolves are just you know, kind of circling, wondering what just happened, right? We put all the work in, and this bear is now sleeping on our kill. So, so that's just kind of a cute example of this, but it, it poses a potentially a, a series of, of important questions about these kind of um, interactions. So there's only so much we can learn from, by analogy, those analogies I was talking about earlier. Um, part of this would have to be, uh, if you were actually going to do this, developing a um, very intense management and monitoring program to try to really understand um, what kinds of effects these animals are having on the landscape at small numbers and as you would ramp up. And um, to be perfectly honest, good monitoring programs and sticking with these things over time is not something we tend to be really good at. Um, and so we need to be able to do better at that and really think hard about that if this kind of a project were to have any success. I think we're, we'll take one more, right? If anybody else has one. Oh, someone, oh, if there's someone else and then we can follow up. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you compare the European brown bear with the American brown bear? Is, is the European brown bear much less dangerous? Is that the reason why it uh, more can be there? So that's, that's the first thing people normally assume. I would say that brown bears um, in the wrong situation could be dangerous regardless. Right? Um, I think the issue is less the kind of inherent um, ferocity of the animal, although one might argue that in Europe for a long time they've been selecting for, <laughs> for more docile animals. Like, so there's a question about whether or not there's been some kind of genetic selection going on there, right? Because they aren't being intensively managed. Um, but really, I think it has much more to do with the recent history of how these animals are. Um, managed. And so if anybody, there's a book that came out a long time ago, maybe in the early 2000s, by David Quammen, great nature writer, right? Monster of God, I don't know who here has read it or remembers it. One of the chapters, it's about human interactions with predators. One of the chapters is about brown bears in Eastern Europe. And he goes through a little bit of the history here. And 
one of the things he concludes is essentially the reason there are so many brown bears in parts of Eastern Europe is that for a long time, these animals were kind of kept as stock f on hunting reserves for a, a kind of royal elite, right? Tin pot dictators, you know, kind of faux royalty, that sort of thing. And so um, that brings up a whole lot of questions about whether or not the current situation with a lot of brown bears on the landscape is viable in an era that's sort of post-Soviet, you know, you know, post all of those arrangements that enabled those things, at least through parts of the 20th century. So there are potentially long-term um, causes, and there are potentially recent historic causes. There may be some genetic component, but these are brown bears. Um, they are different subspecies, um, but they're still the same species. They can still interbreed. They still have the same potential um, to coexist with people or to do harm. Well, thanks, Peter. I just want to say two things. Um, it is uh, great having you speaking, and I really want to thank you for your talk, and it's been really fascinating watching the evolution of that project. Um, and I also wanted to thank our sponsor for tonight, Mammoth Brewing, who the bear is indeed their logo, so it fits in. Um, but I just wanted to remember to thank them for their generosity in sponsoring the seminar, and thank Peter again for coming out and giving such a great seminar. Thanks so much.